Well, Talofa and Māori, everybody. Uh, we'll get underway in a couple of minutes. Uh, really looking forward to this uh, webinar this morning. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes uh, late getting started, but fantastic to have so many people with us. Um, I'll just wait for our uh, core group of participants to begin, and then we'll get underway. All right, I can see we're already ticking over uh, well up into the 70s uh, in our participants' numbers. So uh, talofa for those joining us from Tuvalu, uh, Māori for those joining us from Kiribati, uh, kia ora for those of us joining from uh, New Zealand, um, and uh, warm Pacific greetings to everybody else joining us from across uh, the Asia and Pacific region. Uh, my name is David Dewar. I'm the New Zealand Trade Commissioner for the Pacific with the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, uh, and I've I've got the pleasure of joining uh, a fantastic lineup of speakers today uh, to speak about a very exciting uh, couple of projects that we might be looking at uh, over the coming uh, coming period uh, with our friends in the governments of uh, Kiribati and the governments of Tuvalu, and of course with the Asian Development Bank. Um, before we get underway, uh, I'd just like to really acknowledge our partners in this webinar program, particularly my friends at the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, uh, my friend and colleague, Mr. Adrian Weeks, who's also joining us as a panelist today, uh, our partners at the Business Councils in both New Zealand and Australia and across the Pacific who have been so supportive of the Pacific Projects webinar series, and especially our friends at the Asian Development Bank, uh, who have been just real, real stalwart partners uh, in bringing projects um, to, to our attention and to partnering with us in this webinar series, which has been very, very successful over the past few years. And, and I wanted to note that actually this webinar is a very special one because the first ever Pacific Project Series webinar that we ran at the end of, I think, 2021 was on a, uh, a project in Kiribati, the South Tarawa renewable energy project and it featured some of the, the people on the same call and so it's fantastic to be joined by an outstanding lineup of speakers today uh, headlined by the uh, director general of the pacific regional department of the asian development bank um, Ms. leah guterres uh, and her colleagues uh, cindy cisneros tianko uh, the principal energy specialist of the adb uh, my good friend jenny yanyi chu uh, procurement specialist at the uh, adb suva office um, and uh, Tony Bittar, who is the uh, ADB's uh, technical advisory consultant and will be delivering the substantive presentation. We are also privileged to be joined by two very senior representatives of the governments of both Kiribati and Tuvalu, Mr. Arubas uh, Brechtefeld, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Kiribati Ministry of Infrastructure and Sustainable Energy, and Mr. Mafalu Lotolua, who is the General Manager uh, of the Tuvalu Electricity Corporation, and they are, of course, the the driving partners uh, of this uh, of these two projects. Um, but without further ado, let me please hand over um, to uh, the Director General of the Pacific Regional Department of the ADP, Ms. Leah Gutierrez, to give us some introductory remarks. Vinaka DG. Okay, thanks very much, David, and uh, Talofa and Maori, and good day uh, to all. Um, it's great uh, to have you on this seminar series. Uh, really, thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, just a short introduction. So ADB's energy policy and energy sector uh, vision uh, focuses on the need for climate change, uh, climate adapt adapted and climate resilient, low carbon technologies. Given the heavy resilience on fossil fuels and land constraints, in our small island developing states, or as um, we would uh, actually, uh, you, uh, or as we would use the term uh, in the region, uh, it's the bosses, the big ocean states. Uh, now, at the same time, um, ADB Strategy 2030 actually calls for what we call differentiated and country specific approaches for the Pacific. In this regard, um, for this particular project that we have in Tuvalu and Kiribati, we are consolidating the requirements for goods and infrastructure on a regional scale. Um, so this presents a different and significantly greater challenge, which ADB is now piloting. So this particular two projects in two countries 
is um is something that we are piloting through the uh, through the floating solar projects. Now, um, the procurement of this uh, part of these two projects will be uh, taken on a regional basis, and this is what's going to be presented to you later. I also would like to share with you that um, ADB and the World Bank are undertaking a joint diagnostic study on the e-procurement systems in use across the region. This is close to completion, and at its conclusion, ADB will explore the, vi the viability of introducing a common platform across the region that will, uh, that will aggregate procurement regardless of the funding source. Um, so we hope that uh, with the presentation today, you will learn more about these two very interesting uh, projects that we have in Kiribati and Tuvalu, and also uh, the differentiated approach that we're taking uh, towards uh, procurement in the region. Thank you. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, DG. Um and before we get into our substantive presentations from our from our wonderful panelists today, uh, a message to all of the attendees, you will have seen in the chat box uh, just now, um, the way that this webinar runs, we will soon be uh, moving into our substantive presentations from our colleagues from Tuvalu Kiribati uh, and the ADB, as well as Mr. Bitar. Um, please feel free to write your any questions that occur to you. Um, you will see a little uh, Q&A box uh, down at the bottom of your screens. Um, please click into that and write the questions as we go. As we move into the Q&A session after the substantive presentations, I'll, I'll look at those questions and I'll put those to the panelists. Um, so you won't be able to actually speak or raise your hand and, and, and uh, interject, um, but please feel free to write any questions into that Q&A box as we go, uh, and I'll put those to the, uh, to the panelists. Um, but look, without further ado, I would like now to hand over um, for some more introductory remarks on the specific context for this project um, on the ground or on the water in these vast ocean states, uh, as it were. Um, and I'd like to begin by handing over to uh, the Deputy Secretary of the Kiribati Ministry of Infrastructure and Sustainable Energy, Mr. Uh, Arabas uh, Brechtefeld, uh, for, some, for some contextual remarks. I'll just, I'll just get you to come off mute, please, uh, Mr. Brechtefeld. Sorry, Deputy Secretary. Well, I'm still having trouble uh, hearing you there. Uh, are we? Uh, there might be there might be a sound issue, uh, Mr. Brechtefeld. My my apologies there. Um, looks like the computer might not be picking it up. Um, perhaps while we're while we're rectifying that, we will go across the ocean um, to uh, Mr. Lotolua in Tuvalu um, because I know his sound was working. He spoke to me earlier. Um, and uh, Mafalu, if you would like to uh, make some comments from... Uh... Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, David. And uh, I just want to say a few remarks of what we're trying to do here in Tuvalu. So good afternoon and uh, good morning from Tuvalu to all our participants for, for this uh, webinar. Uh, so many thanks for joining us uh, today. And uh, this is an indication that uh, you are all interested in what we are doing here in the Pacific, as uh, uh, Director General was mentioning. So I believe you have heard or seen somewhere of what we are trying to develop out here in Tuvalu and also in Kiribati. And so joining us today will be a good and perfect opportunity for you to hear in advance the information of what is coming up soon. Uh, as you know that uh, in Tuvalu, we have set a 100% uh, uh, renewable energy, and that is to be achieved by 2030. Well, we, we started off with uh, from 2020, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't uh, achieved that. So the government shifted to 2025, and now it's 2030. So... Hopefully with the uh, ADB is assisting Tuvalu in this uh, uh, target, I think we'll be reaching there. So uh, the consultant is working on what the upcoming projects will be with Kiribati. 
So I think it will be an interesting one as the, uh, what is we developing is a floating PV. And uh, and this is the first of its kind in Tuvalu. And I, and I believe also the, uh, the, uh, the region, Pacific region as a whole. So it's very interesting to see that. And uh, I hope that uh, what ADB and Tuvalu is planning to achieve, it will be replicated elsewhere, you know? Because as you know, Tuvalu is, we have limited space and that's where we move towards uh, the lagoon. So we hope that uh, having this project coming up will be, uh, you finding very interesting to you guys. So. And I would also like in this opportunity to acknowledge the uh, ADB's financial assistance to us. And uh, I trust that uh, with the donor partners for having faith and trust in the Tuvalu Electricity uh, Corporation and for us to manage and operate this very important project in Tuvalu. So once again, thanks so much for joining and looking forward for fruitful discussions. Thanks very much, David. Thank you, Mr. Lotolua. Um, I will try Mr. Brechtefeld again. Um, it looks like he's logged off and logged back on uh, just to see if there's been an opportunity to uh, to try and fix the mic. If not, he'll have the last word in the webinar. So, uh, sir, do you want to try uh, unmuting and uh, offering any remarks? I think we might still be struggling with the uh, with the audio input um, uh, on that one. I apologise if it's a problem with the Zoom platform, sir. Um, look, we will we'll move on to our substantive speakers, but I'll give you the the, the final right of reply if we can uh, if we can work the audio uh, by the end. But uh, um, moving on, uh, perhaps uh, to our first substantive speaker from the uh, Asian Development Bank. Um, Cindy Cisneros Tianco, uh, the Principal Energy Specialist. Uh, Cindy, I think, will give us a, uh, a couple of slides uh, um, if you want to share your screen, Cindy, um, about the context for the project. Hi, good morning. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen now. Okay, thank you. So uh, welcome everyone to this uh, second of our series also in what we call the Emerging Areas Knowledge Event, a Knowledge Sharing Series, and in partnership, of course, with uh, New Zealand and Australia that we are uh, presenting this first ever regional procurement of two projects in uh, ADB. And this is an innovative approach, but it's also an innovative um solutions to what we are offering to the Pacific. So floating PV, this project here will be the first floating solar plus or near shore marine floating solar projects to be deployed in the Pacific. So the first of them is the Tuvalu Increasing Access to Renewable Energy Project is additional financing to an ongoing project. And this was approved in December, 2023. The second is the proposed South Taro Renewable Energy Project in Kiribati. This is the second phase also of our renewable energy intervention in, uh, in Kiribati. So you can see on the slide, the project sites. For Tuvalu, uh, we have earmarked a, a couple of locations, but the particular uh, project will focus on the Northern portion of the site. Whereas uh, for, for uh, Kiribati, we actually have three uh, specific components to the project. There is a 33 kV, transmission line uh, 30 kilometers from Bonriki to Beso. And then we have a battery uh, energy storage system in Bonriki and then the floating PV in Beso. So you will, you will, you will have a, uh, these slides after the, the presentation. So you can see the actual locations, uh, indicative locations, of course, of these two projects. Just to give a little bit of um, additional information, to these projects. As I mentioned, these uh, the Tuvalu project has been approved, but not yet effective, whereas Kiribati is expected to be approved by the end of this year. Um, the Tuvalu additional financing, sorry, did I just lose it? Sorry. Can you still see my screen? 
We can see both of the slides, but uh, that's okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so- Here we go, uh, perfect. Yeah, so we have four co-financiers for the uh, Tuvalu project of the ADB, the Global Environment Facility, the Urban Resilience Trust Fund. Why is it closing? Sorry, sorry about that. And then the Ireland Trust Fund with the government also providing full finance, uh, counterpart financing. For Kiribati, we only have two uh, financiers, the ADB as well as the Ireland Trust Fund. And uh, indicatively, the, the design, build, operate and maintain packages for the, for the, for the projects will be around 4.2 million for Tuvalu and around 20.5 million for Kiribati. So the regional procurement in uh, will make sense so that we can have economies of scale for the two projects. Uh, both will be running until 2028 and 2029. So that's a target and looking forward to, you know, your questions as to other specific details of the projects. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, as Cindy made very clear, the um, uh, this uh, elements of this project are not yet formally approved. And of course, this is not a, a formal procurement uh, process. And that is the beauty, of course, of the Pacific Project Series webinars, um, where we can talk in general terms about upcoming um, about upcoming projects to build that awareness and visibility amongst the supplier network. So um, really appreciate you making uh, your time. And those uh, caveats that you mentioned, Cindy, are very well, uh, very well recognized, I'm sure. Uh, but now I think is the moment that, uh, that 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 everyone's been waiting for, which of course is the detail of the uh, project itself. Uh, and for that, I'm delighted to hand over to Mr. Tony Bitter, uh, dialing in from Auckland after a couple of uh, flight issues earlier this morning. Uh, but he's made he's made it uh, to where he needed to be, uh, and Tony will be sharing a presentation with us on the uh, substance of the uh, proposed um, the proposed projects in both Kiribati and Tuvalu. Tony, please take it away. Tony, you might be muted. Uh, we can see the slides perfectly, though. Hi, Talofa, Mari, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a, a, a couple of projects, a single project, in fact, which is a regional project that is part of a large program called Floating Solar PV Plus in 11 countries of the Pacific Islands. So these are two first projects combined uh, to go forward from a study that covered 11, pick 11 countries. The TA is a regional, as I say, it's been supported by the Asian Clean Energy Fund established by the government of Japan under the Clean Energy Financing Partnership. And of course it's administered by the ADB. As you heard, uh, this specific project going forward is covering uh, the Republic of Kiribati and uh, Tuvalu, two uh, islands in the Pacific that I have specific requirements for total 100% renewable uh, to reduce and almost eliminate imported petroleum supplies. Uh, you can see the two islands here. Uh, one of them is right in the middle of the Pacific. The other is slightly off. Uh, but both of them have specific requirements for a large scale renewable offset of diesel. And also they have specific location uh, requirements that I'll go forward uh, and explain in a minute. We looked at floating PV. Uh, we know that floating PV requires stricter standards uh, because it's in the water, but it has advantages over land-based PV. Most of them are uh, highlighted here. It frees up land for other use in countries that have very little amount of land that is usable. 
uh, it can allow higher yields due to the cooling factor of, of the water. It also conserves that water through reduced evaporation. It's very quick to install compared to other systems. Uh, but also what we have actually tried to focus on as well is to address issues related to how that energy can be used to promote food production and climate uh, resilience. So we have looked at the nexus of energy, water, food, and climate. I will talk about the technologies and then explain the how we applied them to these two projects. The FPV technology is actually a very simple uh, concept. It is different from ground mount, but it has four components that are quite understandable. There's a floating system. That floating system is anchored by a mooring system. There are electrical cables and there is the equipment, PV modules, uh, inverters, batteries sometimes, and connections to the grid. So why, why is PV, FPV uh, able to be applied reasonably and more effectively in Kiribati and Tuvalu? Because first of all, the cost of water surface is lower than the land in these countries. The land can have alternative uses. As I said, it reduces evaporation rates and algal growth. It has lower visual impact. It can have higher energy yield. And therefore, it offers a cost balance between land and sea usage. It can be used with and without or without water. But when you look at all these advantages, it actually looks like it is optimal for specific island nations because they do have a surfeit of water, they have a lack of land, and as you will see later, FPV can actually promote certain uh, aspects that are very beneficial to th these countries that are threatened by climate issues. So the second technology that we looked at under this FPV is the battery storage technologies that we could this, uh, deploy. Uh, the functions of the batteries are well known. They are they give energy storage and autonomy. Uh, they can offer voltage and current stabilizations in countries where the uh, the power production is not as solid as in other countries. Uh, they can supply peak currents. And they actually overall can grid support quite uh, ancillary service like peak shifting and power smoothing. We have looked at several technologies. Uh, we have looked at lead acid batteries. Uh, there are possible uh, absorbed glass mat systems, uh, lithium ion batteries, and even bet other battery technologies with equal or even better performance in general, such as redox flow, sodium sulfide, zinc air, etc. We've looked at all of these technologies in the uh, aspect of, of application in the Pacific Islands. We have also uh, cognizant of the fact that a lot of these islands do not have a very solid or extensive grid infrastructure. We have looked at how to improve those through uh, studying electric systems, electric poles, for example, within electric poles, uh, concrete electric poles, steel tubular poles. We've looked at all of those. We've looked at what type of electrical cables would be most suitable. Uh, and we have actually tried to see how the towers should be designed uh, to carry these ABC cables. Uh, we make sure that they have a minimum duration of 40 years. And uh, be placed in appropriate situations on the ground in all these Pacific Island countries. Uh, we have also looked at electrical cables that are suitable, and we have actually zoomed in on uh, types of cables that would be easy to field in 
these countries and we've come for example with uh, the area abundant cables as an, a very good option for these countries uh, so far the technologies now once we have looked at the fpv we know very well that fpv can actually promote very productive uses for these countries and uh, we tried to explore this quite uh, seriously by starting with what is a productive use of energy? Uh, we see that energy, once it's available, can promote agricultural, commercial, industrial activities. Uh, they can be a direct or indirect input for production of goods or provision of services with increase in income and productivity. All objectives that are very uh, positive for these countries. So that is the first thing that we look at seriously is FPV and reef growth. Uh, the, the reefs are the main indicator of ecosystem health and they are also a source of economic uh, income for the big countries. Uh, coral reefs are endangered at the moment in a number of those. Uh, so that has been one of the first uh, productive uses that we have looked at and tried to uh, promote. Uh, we have zoomed in on a specific uh, technology like BioRock, which you see here. It's basically uh, a, a technology that enables uh, coral reefs to grow at a fast pace and once they do grow they provide an environment for a number of productive uh, economies uh, they uh, i'll give some more details about the bio bio rock or mineral accretion method um, what it is based on is uh, electricity that Put, is put into conductive materials. These conductive materials can be uh, reusable materials such as steel uh, to build marine structures. The steel needs to be protected from corrosion, uh, prepared and then submerged. And a low voltage from the renewable energy field uh, is passed through it. And that low voltage electricity uh, in sea water can produce electrolysis that fosters the production of calcium carbonate that adheres to the structure. Once that calcium carbonate adheres to the structure, it gives coral uh, a basis or a matrix to grow. And one of the big advantages of this growth is that with electricity, you can actually grow a reef about up to four times uh, faster than natural growth. So the Biorock method uh, and any other method as well can accelerate the growth of reefs in uh, these areas. Uh, it's important to note that uh, if we look at these countries they do have a lot of material to re to recycle so we benefit we, we we actually add that benefit to the deployment of biorock we also uh, enable local production of these structures and use the fpv electricity to feed them and grow the uh, coral reefs that become a real ecosystem for uh, aquaculture, for example. So in, gen in general, we can actually provide, promote something that has uh, a recyclable component, uh, uses renewable electricity, and ends up uh, promoting aquaculture and creating some sort of economic growth uh, on aquaculture. Uh, we do have in uh, our studies uh, a, a, a large 
uh, but to do with using FPV for coastal protection. So we need to protect the field, but at the same time, we actually uh, protect the whole coastal area at the same time that is being used for the solar field. And I will show you how that is done. But as part of the BioRock concept, you can see done at the right hand side, a structure that is built. And that structure actually grows the coral. So that's one barrier. But we look at a further barrier to protect the field, which actually also has consequences for coastal protection. And that barrier is a wave breaker. We will be implementing, we'll be requiring to implement a wave breaker for the field and as well as the BioRock sunken structure. And both of them work for wave attenuation and reef growth. Another aspect of FPV feeding into productive uses is to do with FPV and mobility. FPV can power directly charging stations for any electric vehicles that may be implemented. Uh, it's directly usable for uh, charging stations for commercial, domestic, industrial uh, consumers. So the FPV field can, can actually support charging stations of several uh, levels of uh, power generation, power capacity, uh, and feed into a mobility implementation in these islands. Uh, what we are th thinking of in terms of mobility is something that will decrease the number of vehicles, but increase the mobility of the people themselves, the connectivity and utilization of the vehicles. The limited size of the PIC-11 countries makes them ideal for utilization of e-vehicles without having to worry about the mileage that is covered. So uh, we have looked at investments in electric charging stations that would revolutionize mobility in the PIC. And we have looked on both land and on the water. And you will see when I present the projects for Kiribati and Tuvalu, how that has been implemented. Uh, mobility, as I say, is for e-vehicles, but people know about that quite a lot. But we also looked at the charging stations, the various levels of charging uh, for maybe electric vehicles, small vehicles, but also large uh, 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 vehicles, both on land and at, on the sea. So we have looked at e-boats for these countries. And the idea of the e-boats uh, can be recreational. E-boats can be used for fishing. And we have even looked at e-ferries that would be applicable in, the, in all these 11 countries. Now that I've shown what we have looked at in terms of FPV and the productive uses of FPV, uh, I will concentrate on the two projects that we are really looking at now. They are in fact a single project from our point of view. It's a regional project. It's the first time that we really employ these technologies outside of a single country or a single project. And those two projects are, as you have heard, the first one is the South Tarawa Renewable Energy Project Phase 2, which follows Strep 1, which is imp being implemented right now in South Tarawa. And the second one is the Tuvalu one, Increasing Access to Renewable Energy Project, Additional Financing. So it's following an already uh, ongoing project, which is called Increasing Access to Renewable Energy. It's supplementing it using FPV and productive uses of energy. So we've developed the bidding documents and we're soon going to be going out to tender uh, once ADB approves the process. But we have uh, a very brief explanation of the scope of work. 
Uh, as you can see, uh, we, we expect uh, detailed design of the project site. We expect manufacture, supply, factory testing, finishing, uh, shipment, and delivery to site of the of all the various equipment that we'd be uh, asking for, installation and construction work, provisions of drawings, etc., ONM, and support for ONM uh, beyond just construction and operation and maintenance of the facilities for a period of no less than 12 months. Right, so the South Taro Renewable Energy Project is in Kiribati. Uh, it requires a four megawatt AC floating PV with a minimum of five megawatt peak plant, PV plant at Besso and in the diagram, in the picture on the right, you will see the site that has been selected. On top of that, uh, we have a request for a battery energy storage system, which is three MVA, three megawatt hours, to feed all of that into the grid. We are expecting a grid upgrade, grid infrastructure upgrade, to actually provide thirty-three kilovolt ring upgrade at RMU 63 and, uh, and at Besso and at Bonriki to allow the production of electricity, which is in one area of the country, to actually go all the way to the other area of the country in Besso. Uh, on top of that, of course, as I said before, we will ask for a pilot of the incorporation and which incorporates the productive uses of energy that are appropriate to Kiribati. And these are uh, four e-vehicles, small to medium size, with charging stations for 11 kV and 33 kV, so as to enable both small size and large size transport on land. We will also be asking for coastal protection and uh, measurements uh, that I have uh, to do with uh, breakers and biorock. The layout that we have developed for Kiribati is shown here. Uh, we expect each floating PV module to be 500 kilowatt each. So you will have uh, the, the, the numbers of modules that are appropriate for eight uh, for four megawatt is shown in here in in the drawings. The concept for the actual panels and floaters is also given on the right hand side. We are asking for uh, a five degree east west type uh, construction for the modules and the floating body. On top of that, we are asking for uh, a wave breaker, which is shown on the bottom right here, and the BioRock system. So that's for Kiribati. Now, what are we asking for for Tuvalu? It'll be a one megawatt AC floating PV, which reflects a minimum of 1.25 megawatt peak at Fangafale, and associated grid infrastructure. Uh, we are going to be asking for climate proofing measures uh, to protect this infrastructure from all potential weather effects. We are also asking once again for Tuvalu for incorporation of interesting productive uses of energy. These ones cover coastal protection as well and the, the disaster risk reduction. But interestingly enough, for Tuvalu, we will be asking for an, a larger e-boat, uh, two spare motors, two charging stations. The larger e-boat will actually offset diesel e-boats, diesel boats, and will offset diesel generation that way, diesel use in transporting students from their houses to their school and back. 
And beyond that, the eBird will be usable for transportation inside the lagoon in Fungafali. So here we have a, an extension of the productive uses in mobility towards use on water rather than just on land. Uh, what is the layout that we are uh, requesting or, or providing as, a, as an indicative layout? Uh, as you saw before, uh, we had several areas that are studied, but we have focused on this particular area, which was shown by Cindy previously. And we are again using exactly the same type of floating PV with uh, a breaker. So it's 500 kilowatt uh, islands, if you like, two of them, two arrays with uh, different orientations, minus 90 degree and 90 degrees, uh, it's joined to form uh, an island with a minimum of two islands and a maximum of four islands in that area. Again, these floating PV will be protected by uh, wave breakers. And we will also ask for uh, bio rock uh, implementation beyond these uh, uh, wave breakers. That is basically the content of each of the two projects. Uh, there will be delivery, but also operation and maintenance of each and all of the, com of the components of each contract for at least a period of 12 months after commissioning. Uh, I'd like to add that these two regional projects are the first of many that could be inspired by the work that we've done over the PIC 11 countries. And I thank you for your uh, time and patience. Over to you, David. Thank you very Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, fantastic presentation. Um, and of course, that is uh, always the highlight of these sessions, um, followed very closely um, by uh, the next uh, the next presentation, a brief one from uh, my colleague uh, and friend, Jenny Yanyi Chu, procurement specialist at the ADB, um, who will be uh, going into a bit more detail on some of the procurement aspects of this project, um, uh, which I think will preempt some of the questions that are being asked. But great to see some appearing in the Q&A now. Jenny, over to you. Thank you, David, um, Molly Kalova, Carola, and good day, everyone. Um, I will try to keep my um, breathing quick in the interest of time, um, just to highlight maybe some of the, the key point that, that's um, quite unique to this particular um, uh, regional Pokemon package. Um, and also really good to see some of the family and names um, who attended our um, regional um, Pokemon um business option seminars in, in Nandi uh, in collaboration with other development partners. Um, so sort of building on that conversation, um, ADB is committed to promote um, opportunities and also participation um, for our projects in Pacific region. And um, as part of that, uh, we understand that um, maximizing opportunity for participation um, is very key. And I think just sort of explain how these came about um, of the, the regional Pokemon. As Cindy mentioned, it's the first regional Pokemon in ADB, not just on this region. So I think that's something that um, is very unique in this nature. So um, ourselves and also our colleagues will be watching the, the outcome of these exercise very closely um, to inform um, future thinking as well. So um, this is one way of trying to do things differently to increase opportunity to um, to the market, um, increase efficiency in procurement and also reducing the risk associated with the um, maybe remoteness of the of the location um, uh, and also the supply chain risk as well. So um, during early phase of these projects, um, the team has undertaken a strategic procurement plan exercise that has taken into account 
um, the the commonality of the scope, which Tony and Cindy already um, covered. And we have conducted a market survey uh, to understand the capacity of um, of available company and um, there was an open survey um, on what can be supply and capacity and that sort of informed some of the the details of the packaging uh, without going into the the details because the bidding documents will not be released yet but I would just want to maybe uh, highlight the the feature of these regional procurement is really a combo package in all front it's combo in the sense that it covers two countries two projects you have two contracts or in one procurement transaction. So you, your effort could potentially um, arising in, in two, um, two contracts rather than having to bid twice. Um, and I think I want to highlight is that because combo approach in the, the requirement for both of these packages um, through the single procurement transaction needs to be met. Um, it's also a combo approach uh, in, in, the, in the sense of um, uh, evaluation consideration as well that um, the procurement will be using what we call merit point criteria, uh, which you would have heard in some of the forum before, um, where it will take into account combination of both um, quality related attribute and, and of course uh, cost consideration, um, including um, the whole of um, life consideration, um, covering operation maintenance aspect as well. Um, it's a combo package approach um, because the evaluation um, team will be consistent of um, uh, delegate authorities from both the government of Kiribati and to validate and assisted by consultant funded by ADP. So um, all in all, it's really a combo package that um, we are experimenting for the first time. Um, so we look forward to um, your engagement and participation um, and we hope that this will become a good um, you know, pioneer of an of approach that will um, enhance um, participation in, in the Pacific. So I think I will, I will stop here. Um, my final point is also that um, in light of these um, project related webinars, we look forward to um, further, um, you know, opportunity to share advanced um, information about upcoming pipeline and procurement opportunities um, through this program and other channels um, uh, in response to some of the feedback we received from the market on, um, on this point. I'll stop here. Thanks very much. That, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, and uh, look, once again, we really appreciate the opportunity to engage with the ADB um, and the governments um, and utilities across the region in conversations like this. I think suppliers find it extremely valuable. And I noticed that you've already seen a couple of the questions that were asked um, and, and have preempted that in your um, response there. But let's get into the Q&A now. I'm conscious that we're running very close to time. Um, ordinarily, we would be allowing a lot more time for these Q&A um, but uh, I, some of them have already been answered in the written chat. Um, but let's get underway. Uh, the, the first question was uh, in there, which um, Mr. Lotalua has uh, put up his hand to uh, answer, and that's whether there's a benefit to marine life under the array. I think that might have been covered a bit in Tony's presentation. But uh, Mafala, was there anything that you wanted to add to that? Sorry, David. I think I give it to Tony. I think. Uh, oh, so you gave it to Tony. Yeah. Okay. Again. Per again, per perfect. I, I, I think I think that was very comprehensively answered in the uh, in the slide there as well. Uh, but uh, Tony, anything you wanted to add to the marine life just, question? Just that, just that the the uh, floating PV will actually cover and uh, minimize the growth of algae under the field, and uh, and it, well, with with the uh, bio rock growth there'll be more possibilities of uh, reef uh, fish coming in and using that area. Uh, there, there, are, there are synergies that are small. There, there will be a better, we, we believe that there will be a better situation and better, better environment under those fields for uh, aqua, aqua, well, aquatic life to progress and improve. But that is... Uh, uh, I, I don't want to emphasize that too much. Th thank, thanks, uh, Tony. And, and while we're on the subject of the, you know, the specific kind of structural stuff around FPV, there are some quite specific ones in there from a questioner who's asking. Um, firstly, 
um, uh, it, if you're looking at the Bezio example, uh, the reef and sand flats can dry out on a low spring tide. Um, would that mean that your floats would be sitting on the reef at a, at a very low tide in that situation? And then a second sort of follow up question from the same questioner is: um, Has the influence of coastal defence works um, on the net westerly longshore sediment transport down the shoreline, and there, therefore likely erosion um, of the coast between the installation and port? Has that also been assessed? Uh, two long questions. Uh, the, an the answer to the first one is that the, the uh, way the geo, geo uh, tubes that we will be using are already experimented with in terms of land modification and land growth inside the lagoon. And that is not a technology that is uh, totally unknown. It's actually a very useful technology and they will be sitting on uh, the sand right from the start to actually stop the uh, waves from they, they are wave breakers and they will be sitting on the on the uh, sand in the areas that we're looking at at the moment the bio rock will be beyond that uh, the bio rock will actually create reef in areas that will not be clear uh, they will always be underwater Thank you very that's much, the, Tony. That's the um, to that... the first question. The second question, oh, okay. uh, I'm not very clear. It was very long. And I, could you please repeat it so that I know exactly what it has... is that it's asking? <laughs> yes. No, it's a very, very technical one. Has the influence of the coastal defense works for the installation on the net westerly longshore sediment transport down the shoreline? So I presume they're talking about the, um, the uh, effect of uh, sediment just kind of going down the net westerly um, uh, shoreline there it doesn't say which country and therefore basically are there are there any kind of erosion uh, impacts that have been studied um, by placing this installation in that uh, in that path well there's an, there's a number of studies that we've carried out to make sure that we are selecting the right site for each of the pvs we uh, just to go back a little bit on uh, if we have time we actually studied uh, up to 12 sites in each of these two countries before finishing off on the one site where there's a minimum of wave intervention, there's a minimum of uh, if, uh, uh, problems of sedimentation or, or non-sedimentation on uh, what we're building. Uh, and the sites have been selected uh, after studies of wave dynamics as well to make sure that the FPV floating systems are actually protected from a number of possibilities. Uh, and those I have actually uh, informed the site selection. The site selection is very thorough uh, and, and we want to make sure that these floating PV systems will last 25, 30, maybe even 40 years. Th thanks, Tony. And there is That's... ongoing measurements at the moment in both countries of the wave dynamics that will go on for a number of years to inform what happens inside the lagoon, not outside, inside the lagoon, where the wave dynamics are a lot more favorable and they may answer the drift and the uh, sedimentation issues even further. That, thanks, Tony. There are a couple of um, questions in there that are also sort of comments around uh, around the project. Um, Cindy, I see, is answering one now that I think is a more specific one about the project scope itself, whether there's a SCADA-type system required uh, as part of the project scope to monitor and control the power systems. The SCADA systems are available already in both countries. And, of course, uh, any addition to uh, the systems... Uh, the grids will require interface with the existing SCADA. That's 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 a helpful clarification. Thank you, Tony. Now, look, we've actually reached time. I'm conscious we started about five minutes late, so I'm happy to continue answering the questions that we have in the chat, but we'll leave it probably at the end of those. Um, so just moving back down, there's a question about how frequently the panels will need to be cleaned um, and whether the salt uh, water will create cover that might make it less efficient. Has that been factored into the design? Uh, that is, that's factored in every design of every PV plant. 
uh, it's part of the operation and maintenance of a system. And that is uh, one of the reasons why we expect the systems to be monitored, operated, and maintained for at least 12 months with a capacity building element to show how they can be maintained indefinitely by the people on the ground. In other words, the owners of the plant will actually be taught how to maintain them and make sure that the operation is correct. Uh, typically, the cleaning frequency will depend on how soil they become. Uh, and, and that will be uh, specifically designed for each site uh, through the experience of the uh, providers in the operation. And maintenance. Thank you, Tony. Um, uh, continuing on the sort of environmental theme, uh, this is more of a comment, and so feel free not to answer, but uh, an anonymous attendee has posted that there seems to be some difference of opinion about the um, uh, the benefits, I suppose, of uh, calcium aggregation um, uh, as part of the mineral accretion technology that may be good in the short term and maybe not so good in the long term um, and health of the reef. Uh, hope that the team can also monitor and assess these. Um, feel free to take that as read um, or any, any comment you wish to add. Otherwise, we can move on. I, I can make the comment that uh, the, during during the operation and maintenance uh, there will be people on the ground, local people, who will actually monitor what is happening to the to the bio rock or whatever uh, accretion method we end up with, and that has already been done overseas in a number of sites. So there's a lot of experience on that through the bio rock system, uh, but we are also making sure that we gain even more experience of its application in Kiribati and Tuvalu through what I've just mentioned. Thanks, Tony. Um, uh, is there a risk of F to the FPV during storms? There's a risk of anything uh, that, is, <laughs> that is implemented during storms. Uh, the, the storms actually provide waves. Uh, what we have looked at very seriously is these two countries have lagoons. And as I said, we started off with 12 sites in each one, 12 general areas. We selected very thoroughly the best site for uh, uh, wave, uh, minimized wave dynamics. Kiribati doesn't have cyclones, uh, so that has been an easier task. But on top of that, we've actually uh, started uh, a, a, a program of uh, modeling with uh, the South Pacific Research Organization to extend their modeling of wave dynamics inside lagoons, because these two countries have lagoons. They are, uh, they've, they've developed those uh, models for us to define the wave dynamics and the maximum waves that can happen inside those lagoons, inside those specific areas. And on top of that, we, as I mentioned before, we are fielding uh, a large number of monitoring stations inside those lagoons, especially where our sites are. And they will be ongoing for at least five years to indicate, and, and they'll be used locally by the local people to actually gain information on wave dynamics for further use. That, thanks, Tony. That That's great. Um, uh, really comprehensive answer there. Um, we're into our final questions now. Um, uh, the first one here is there, is there any consideration around designating the area around the installations as a marine reserve or a protected area? And then if so, how would that impact the project in terms of design or access or any other requirements? Uh, I'm not sure it's my prerogative to answer this because it's not me. <laughs> but that, all I no, can that, say that's is great. That we could we could actually we could hold that one if you like because we are going to finish I'll, with our with I'll, our representatives. I'll just add, and then you can ask you can ask other people to comment on that who who are government people. But uh, we we looked at the security of the floating PV systems, 
uh, and we have proposed some uh, potential ways of protecting them from interference, from other damage that is possible. Uh, but uh, marine reserves are not my field, so to speak. Thank Thank, thank you, uh, Tony, and um, I think that's a very nice segue into our final um, into our final um, the speakers for the uh, for the uh, uh, event. Um, I'll just I'll just ask one more question because it's a more specific one to the project that's just come in, but this will be our last question. Um, is a geotechnical uh, investigation also required for the mooring structures as part of the project scope? Yes, always. Yes. 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 Excellent. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I will now move to uh, Mr. Arubas uh, Brechtefeld, who I think has, uh, who I think has made his sound now working. Um, Mr. Deputy Secretary, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, if you'd like to bring us home with some with some remarks. Thank you, David. Uh, can everyone hear me now? Hello. We certainly can. All right, Mary. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. It has been uh, wonderful. The, all the presentations have been uh, awesome. It's uh, it's exciting to see how this uh, project is uh, progressing. And I'm happy to speak about the transformative uh, impact of the Asian Development Bank uh, Energy Project in Kiribati, uh, particularly focusing on the innovative solutions of floating uh, solar and solar and protective uses of the post uses that are bolstering the resilience of Tarawa energy infrastructure. Uh, Kiribati, like many Pacific Island nations, has long faced uh, challenges in achieving energy security. Historically uh, reliant on imported uh, diesel fuel, the nation has grappled with high energy cost and vulnerability to global fuel uh, price fluctuations. However, uh, ADP South, South Tarawa Renewable Energy Project strip is uh, changing the narrative. This uh, <clears throat> project aims to reduce Kiribati's dependence on fossil fuels by significantly increasing the share of re renewable energy in its electricity generation mix. One of the standout features of this initiative is the in installation of the solar photovoltaic systems and battery energy storage systems. These uh, technologies not only provide a cleaner and more sustainable energy source, but also enhance the reliability and stability of power supply on South Tarawa. <clears throat> By harnessing the, the abundant solar energy, Kiribati is taking a significant step toward the low carbon future. Moreover, in, the introduction of floating solar power system, uh, solar PV system, is a game changer for Kiribati. Given limited land availability, floating solar panels on water bodies offer an innovative solution to maximize solar energy generation without competing for land resources. These floating solar arrays are more efficient due to the cooling effect of water, which increases their energy output. Additionally, this will be integrated with coastal protection measures, further enhancing the resilience of islands infrastructure. The productive uses of energy generated from these renewable sources are equally important. By providing reliable and affordable electricity, this project supports various economic activities as well, from small businesses to essential services like healthcare, and education. This not only improves the quality of life for the residents of Tarawa, but also fosters economic growth and development. In closing, uh, my friends, uh, ADP's energy project in Kiribati are paving the way for a sustainable and resilient energy future. The integration of floating solar and productive uses of energy is not just a technological advancement, but a beacon of hope for a more resilient and self-sufficient Kiribati. As we continue to embrace these innovations, we move closer to a future where clean, reliable, and affordable energy is accessible to all. Thank you, David.
Thank you, Deputy Secretary Arubas. Uh, those are really, really powerful words, and I think um, you know, put all of this in context. I mean, this is you know, at once at one level, it's a project. Uh, at another level, uh, altogether, it's something that's incredibly important for the uh, infrastructure development uh, and the livelihoods uh, and lives of real people uh, in this phenomenal part of the world and the blue ocean superpowers of uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu. Um, and uh, a really, really valuable thing. Thank you so much again to our wonderful panelists today, the Dep uh, the Director General, uh, Ms. Gutierrez, um, uh, to Cindy, our Principal Energy Specialist of the ADB, Jenny, Procurement Specialist at the ADB, uh, um, Tony Bitter, the, the consultant uh, who's been designing all of this and uh, and I know is very, very passionate about the subject, um, having, having said uh, two webinars on the same uh, sort of topic now. Um, and of course, um, uh, Mr. Lotulua, the General Manager of the Tuvalu Electricity Corporation, and as you've just heard from Deputy Secretary Mr. Arubas uh, Brechtefeld, uh, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, as is my tradition, I would like to offer the floor very finally to uh, my good friend Mr. Adrian Weeks, the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner from Austrade, uh, to wrap us up. Adrian, if you if you are still on the line, please feel free. Oh, yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, look, excellent to uh, learn about the new projects and particularly in this area where they're uh, very topical at the moment. Uh, it's a terrific solution uh, and there's a lot of capability, I think, from the services side as well as the installation and the solution side that uh, you know, companies from Australia and New Zealand can participate and deliver. So I think it's a very exciting um, forum. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you to our ADB colleagues and thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, we'll be in touch with uh, copies of the slideshows to all of those who dialed in. Thank you once again, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you David. Excellent Bye. moderation.